How was your week back? Busy, busy, but good. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Divinity Lutheran Church. We're here to worship the one true triune God and to be spiritually fed through his means of grace. On Wednesday, uh, we descend into that, that somber season of Lent, one of the uniquely Lutheran co contributions to the church here is to have Transfiguration Sunday right before Lent. Uh, to have this wonderful moment where we get to see and reflect upon Jesus' glory before we enter church season where we talk a lot about Jesus' humiliation and, and his suffering. So this is a this is an island of, of, of peace and joy before the, the season of the church here that we could say is a little bit darker, um, a little bit uh, a little bit more somber. Uh, than the rest of the church here. So Transfiguration Sunday is a wonderful blessing. We see Jesus' glory. God will bless us as we worship today. Let's begin with our opening hymn, hymn 543, O Jesus King Most Wonderful. Mm -hmm.
service setting one, page 154, in the front of your hymnals, page 154. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you in my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son. Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue on page 156. In peace, let us pray to the Church of God. 
O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. And in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus our King, and bring us at last to heaven through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson for Transfiguration Sunday is taken from Exodus chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not realize that the skin of his face was shining because he had been speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, they were amazed that the skin of his face was shining. So they were afraid to come close to him. Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the rulers of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came close to him, and he gave them all of the commands that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses was finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out again. Then he would come out and tell the people of Israel what he had been commanded. Whenever the people of Israel saw Moses' face, they would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining. Then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord again. This is the word of the Lord. God. I got it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> the word of the Lord, I should have said. Thank you for getting it right. The epistle lesson is taken from St. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 3, beginning with the seventh verse. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look directly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, though it was fading, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be much more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation has glory, the ministry that brought righteousness has even more glory. In fact, in this case, what was glorious is no longer very glorious because of the greater glory of that which surpassed it. Indeed, if what is fading away was glorious, how much more glorious is that which is permanent? Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites cannot continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord, who is the Spirit, the Word of the Lord. I skipped over the psalm, I apologize for that. Let's, uh, let's sing Psalm 2 right now. So, remember the psalms are pretty early in your hymnals. Find Psalm 2.
please stand and turn to page 161. Last week, the, uh, the choir led us in singing the gospel acclamation, and it went pretty well. So today we're going to just try singing this all together as a congregation. of his face changed, and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were weighed down with sleep, but when they were completely awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not realize what he was saying. While he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid as they went into the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, they found Jesus alone. They kept this secret and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn 388, Down from the Mount of Glory.
peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our consideration today is the Old Testament lesson, Exodus chapter 34. Well, it's been another one of those weeks where I thought to myself, my kids, my grandkids will read about this in their history books. I really didn't think in my lifetime a European nation would be invaded by an aggressor with there being literally no provocation on that nation's part. It's been something, kind of like when the pandemic first started. I watched more news this week than I have in a long, long time. Maybe, maybe you did too. There were some amazing, amazing videos on the news this week. Tanks rolling through Ukraine. The people of Ukraine fighting for their country. Ukrainians in the in the subway singing a hymn. Maybe you saw that one. The the president, President Zelensky, is he's been a pretty impressive guy, hasn't he? With the soldiers. He told the US when the US offered to evacuate him, he said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. There's been a lot of videos and pictures of him with, with the troops in Kiev. While there's been intelligence that Russian special forces are already in the city looking to take him out. Kind of a heroic figure. But there's been a lot of pain and sadness that's been on the TV too. Lots of videos of children crying as fighter jets scream overhead as explosions are in their cities or right outside of their cities. None of us here has ever felt that kind of fear. So I don't think, if you have, I'd, I'd love to hear the story. But the fear of your nation being invaded by an army that, well, it's kind of a David and Goliath situation, isn't it? Your nation being invaded at the direction of a man who has shown to have very little value for human life. Fear, real fear. What's going to happen to your nation, your city, your family, your home, your apartment? Is that what the Bible means when it talks about fearing God? That kind of fear? You remember Luther's explanations to the Ten Commandments. It begins with, we should fear and love God that. We should fear and love God that. And then he explains what the commandment means, what, what God is trying to convey to us. What does it mean to fear God, and what does it mean to love God? We should do both. But well, what exactly does that mean? Exodus 34, I think, can help us understand what it means to fear God and to love God. This is an easy uh, an event that's easy to get mixed up with another event. Moses comes down um, from, from Mount Sinai with two tablets. This is the second time that happened, okay? Moses already did that once. You remember what happened when he came down? He found the Israelites worshiping a golden statue of a calf. After what? After God had led them out of slavery in Egypt with miraculous plagues to defeat the Pharaoh and his army, part of the Red Sea for them to cross through. So three months after that, the Lord comes to Mount Sinai and displays his glory, and Moses goes up and speaks with God, and God gives him these stone tablets. And Moses comes down and finds them engaged in terrible idolatry, debauchery. Aaron giving, us, giving them the statue and saying, here is your God, Israel. Here is your God who led you out of slavery, led you out of Egypt. Remember the consequences? Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. The 
Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and they certainly are a stiff-necked people, so now leave me alone so that my anger can burn hot against them, so that I may consume them and make you into a great nation. Fearing God, that sounds like something to fear, doesn't it? Moses interceded for the people, asked for God's mercy. God relented. And then Moses went up on the mountain again. After, I forgot to mention, there was a plague. God did allow a plague to infect uh, the Israelites. There were consequences, but God did not completely destroy their nation. Moses went up on Mount Sinai, and he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. God gave him new tablets. God told him all the different laws and commands and regulations that he had for this, this special nation, this nation that would be his. And then Moses came down again. And his face was shining with the glory of God. Obvious, isn't it, why this is a Transfiguration Day lesson? Uh, incredible parallel. To, to the same thing or similar thing happening with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And how do the people react? When Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, they were amazed that the skin of his face was shining, so they were afraid to come close to him. Why were they afraid? Well, you probably all would have a little jolt of fear if someone's face was shining supernaturally. But there's more to their fear than that, isn't it? They are afraid because they understand there are consequences to sin. We should fear God because there are consequences to sin. The Bible tells us that over and over. God had just displayed that to the Israelites. There are absolutely consequences for your sin. And of course, the ultimate consequence of sin, the wages of sin is death, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. We don't get away with anything. It can feel like that sometimes, right? Well, I got away with that. We don't get away with anything. The law tells us there are consequences for sin, and that is something to fear. The law is frightful. The law does fill us with fear, and the law is a message from God. <coughs> That's what it means to fear God, to know the message of the law. It's partly what makes evangelism in our day and age so difficult. Today we're going to start a new Bible class. I hope to see many of you there. Um, an introduction to evangelism was really going to make a big push this year after the pandemic derailed our plans. But this is something that makes evangelism difficult. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that our society, many people in our society, have gotten really, really, really good, really practiced and ignoring the law that's written on their hearts. We all have that, that, that natural law, the conscience. People who've never heard of the true God, have never seen the Ten Commandments or read a Bible, feel guilty when they do things that are wrong. But it is possible to ignore that voice push it down, to shut it out, to shout it down. And the more we do that, the easier it becomes. Those pangs of conscience become less and less. Our conscience speaks less and less. And we live in a society where that type of thing is very, very common. So when you come to people to tell them about their savior from sin, they look at you like you're offering them something they don't is this fear that the Israelites had when they saw Moses' face shining, when they thought of the consequences of their sins? That's what led Moses to put a veil on his face, right? That would make a tremendous amount of sense. And I'll tell you that there was a time where I, that, that is what I 
thought. Moses put that veil on his face so that the Israelites wouldn't be afraid as he talked to them. But if you read this carefully, that's not actually what happened. Moses did put a veil on his face. But it wasn't because they were afraid. And he didn't actually do it when he talked to them. He wasn't veiled when he talked to God. And then it says, when he wasn't talking to God, then he veiled himself. But it also says that when he talked to the people, they saw the glory shining from his face. So he was not veiled when he spoke to the people, when he told them what God revealed to him. So what in the world was the point of veiling his face? I don't think there's a way we would understand that if Paul hadn't written 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The key to understanding that Paul reveals to us here in our epistle lesson, um, verse 13, starting verse 13. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. The reason Moses most of the time had a veil on his face is so that the people couldn't see that the radiance, that the glory was fading. There is a glory of God that is revealed in the law. The power of God the majesty of God, that he has the right to tell us what's right and wrong. He has the right to tell us what the consequences of sinning are. He has the right and the power to give us the consequences for sin. But it's a fading glory. It's not a permanent glory, Paul says. The permanent glory is only found in Christ. In spite of this, their minds were hardened, Paul says. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. So those who do not know Jesus, it has not been removed because, it's, because it is taken away only in Christ. And then we see the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He did not veil himself. He allowed Peter, James, and John to see it. It's the glory of the gospel, the glory of the good news. Now, to be clear, the gospel was not held back until the New Testament era. The Old Testament Israelites heard the gospel. And those who really believed, those who really had faith in God, trusted the good news that a Savior would come. God did not only speak law and condemnation to the Israelites. Right before our lesson, in Exodus chapter 30. So again, after, after the, the golden calf, after that terrible betrayal of the Israelites, the betrayal of God, this is what, what God says to Moses and tells him to share this with the Israelites. See, I am making a covenant. They already had done that. The Israelites had immediately broken it. Now God is repeating. I am making a covenant. In the presence of all your people, I will do marvelous things such as have never been created anywhere on earth or in any nation. Did they deserve that? Of course they did. So all the people who are around you will see the work of the Lord, for it is an awe-inspiring thing that I will do for you. Observe what I command you this day. Watch me as I drive out the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Be careful that you do not make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land to which you are going, or it will be a trap in your midst. But you must break down their altars and smash their sacred and memorial stones to pieces, and you must cut down their Asherah poles. So you must worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Do not make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land so that they can prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to their gods. If you do, they will invite you to eat their sacrifices. And they will invite you to take their daughters as wives of your sons, and their daughters will prostitute themselves and make your sons prostitute themselves to their gods. You shall not make any idols for yourselves. 
There are certainly warnings in there. But God renewed his covenant with the Israelites. Worship me and I will make you a special nation. I will drive out your enemies before you. And what happens afterwards, you know the story, right? Again and again and again. They did worship other gods. They did make idols. They trusted in alliances with other nations instead of God. And still God did drive out their enemies before them. He is a merciful God who loves. What does it mean to fear and love God? To love God means to know, to understand, to believe that Jesus suffered the consequences of our sins. Fearing him is to understand that there are consequences. Loving him is to understand that he loved us by putting those consequences on his son himself. What's, what's the transfiguration about? Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus glory. Jesus speaks to Moses and Elijah. And there's this incredibly important phrase here in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 31. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about what Jesus was going to do to reveal the full glory of God, to reveal his full glory. His full glory was not his face shining on that mountain. His full glory was him shedding blood, was his bloody face on that mountain of the skull. The transfiguration was Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah about what was coming up. There's so many important things to draw from that conversation. We can speculate a little bit, I think, and it isn't too dangerous. Was Jesus afraid? We know at other points he was. Was he expressing his fear to Moses and Elijah? Were they encouraging him, strengthening him? Was Jesus explaining what he was going to do to Moses and Elijah? Were they just talking about the, the importance of this? That here it is, everything. Everything was coming to a head. The promise that those two men, Moses and Elijah, had repeated to the people again and again and again. It was finally going to be fulfilled. But don't forget that all important heck that Jesus knew what was coming. Our Jesus is not a victim. President Zelensky is not a Christ figure. But there is something Christ-like in his actions right now. Standing with his people. Fighting for his people. That's what Jesus was going to do. He descends this mount of transfiguration and goes and fights for his people. Not just leading us, but doing all of the fighting for us. What does it mean to fear and love God? To love God means to trust, believe that Jesus fought for us. That he took all of the, of the punishment, all the barbs, all the missiles of the evil one. Jesus stood in front of all of us. This great figure of defense, defending us from everything that we deserve. That's Jesus' glory. Lent is a, a more somber time. But Lent is, is not a time when we just spend six weeks feeling sorry for Jesus. It's not the point. Being sorry over our sins, yes. Recognizing what Jesus did, yes. But also seeing the glory there. There is glory even in Lent. There is glory on, on, on Black Friday. Excuse me, good friend. The glory of Jesus suffering and death for us, the real glory of God, that his love for us is so great that he did whatever had to be done so that we 
to be full. Keep that in mind. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration today, just like Jesus descended the mountain, we're going to descend into, into that valley of Lent. But keep your eyes up, keep your eyes focused on that mountain on the other side of that valley, that mountain that we're walking towards during this Lenten season. The mountain where everything came to a head, where Jesus fulfilled all of God's most important promises to us. Where now, our fear of God is a respect of God. A respect that comes from also understanding his love for us. Fear and love God. Luther begins his explanations to the Ten Commandments with that phrase, except some of you may remember what about way pastor, the first commandment's a little bit different. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Trust God that he's protecting our Christian brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Trust him that he has a plan no matter what happens with that invasion, with that war. Trust him that your sins are forgiven, that you are saved, that someday you will look in Jesus' face. That you will be in the presence of God and his glory will not burn you to a crisp. Because in his eyes, you are holy. Amen. I mean, the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from there you will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. We pray the responsive prayer on page 164. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. I pledge your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruits in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Praise all Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and your people. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially we come to you, Lord, on behalf of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, with whom we and the Wells are in fellowship. Keep the members of that church body safe and healthy. Protect their, their church buildings and their homes. Strengthen their faith. Help them to see opportunities they have to bring the comfort of the gospel to their, their fellow Ukrainians. And Lord, we also ask for your protecting hand over Jacob Pankratz 
our member in the Air Force who has been transferred to Poland, seemingly as part of the effort to show Russia that uh, America will defend uh, fellow members of NATO. So Lord, we, we especially ask that you do not allow this war to spread to those countries with, with whom we have treaties. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. You remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Now receive the offering. You may be seated. singing hymn 389. strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, 
and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. In your worship folder, there's a page called Farewell to Alleluia, or Transfiguration Day Tradition here, Divinity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we next gather for worship, it will be Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. On that day, we will begin our solemn journey to the Savior's cross. While the joy of faith remains undiminished throughout the years, our rejoicing during Lent is muted and quiet. For centuries, therefore, the Christian churches have omitted their most jubilant songs during this season, including the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. Now for a time, we say farewell to Alleluia. We do this to prepare ourselves for the quieter days of Lent. Alleluia will return on Easter dawn as we gather to shout our praise to the risen Lord. You may be seated as we say.
arbitrator, big versus small. When it comes to schools, we might assume that big schools have more opportunities, while small schools have a friendlier atmosphere. But Michigan Lutheran Seminary doesn't fit the mold. Instead, it offers the best of both worlds. It's homecoming at Michigan Lutheran Seminary, with all the excitement and school spirit that you might expect. While this event has all the hallmarks of a big school game, Michigan Lutheran Seminary is better known for its small school atmosphere, as a place where everyone knows your name. It's really nice just because you have such like a family bond with like, everyone here. Everyone is just so welcoming and it feels like you just have a lot of siblings. Many of the students live in dormitories, which fosters lifelong relationships with friends who share a common faith in Jesus. It's just like the best place. Like you're surrounded by other Christians and all your friends are there too, so friends. We gotta trust each other. Like much larger schools, Michigan Lutheran Seminary has a full slate of extracurriculars and a wide range of off-campus experiences to help students learn to express their Christian faith in many different settings. They have opportunities to go out into congregations and schools uh, to shadow a pastor, to learn from a teacher in the classroom, to really get that hands-on experience so they can say, I love this. On campus, students also have unique opportunities to learn about the world, including through the first-hand stories of the school's many international students. Andy Liu, for example, was borrowed from worship in his home country, China. I definitely do appreciate this a lot because back in China, we, we had to hire a violin. The government actually found out that our school was teaching about the Bible, so they had to shut it down. There are people on our campus that don't believe in the Studying the Bible, learning to share the Savior, remains at the core of Michigan Lutheran Seminary's purpose. That mission is most visible in Twice Daily Chapel. But it's part of every class, every activity here. As a preparatory school for high school age students, this campus is dedicated to preparing the next generation of pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries. I would really like to teach music, but maybe I'll let you help them go into faith. I just, I just think so. it's an amazing gift to be able to help them. So, can you tell me what are some things that we notice? While visitors to this school might first notice the state of the art facilities, anyone who spends time here will see something much bigger the love of Christ that guides every hour of every day, with a special goal of shepherding the next generation of leaders who will serve you at your congregation and around the world. Michigan Lutheran Seminary has a positive student to faculty ratio which means the faculty and staff get to know each student as an individual, modeling the kind of one-on-one -on -one care and commitment that call workers bring to congregations like yours. It may seem strange to you, you just watched a video about a high school in Michigan Probably none of our young folks will ever attend there. Remember, Michigan Lutheran Seminary is like Luther Prep School in Watertown. Those are our two synod-owned and run high schools that have the specific purpose of educating uh, young men and women who, who have expressed a desire to perhaps enter the public ministry someday. And a large percentage of our pastors and teachers come from those two schools. Um, so it's very important for us to support them. Um, our mission offerings, you know, the, the money that we send on to Synod, the two major places those monies go are missions and for missionaries, opening new missions in the U.S., and our worker training system, Martin right? Luther College, the seminary, and those two prep schools. Church bodies all over the world, uh, you maybe have seen this in the news, are experiencing major, major worker shortages. Uh, it's going to be a huge issue. Um, it's affecting us in the wells, too. Um, 
if we don't have those prep schools, the situation will get a lot worse. So pray for our, our, our prep schools and uh, support them with your, with your offerings. Thank you for joining us today. Ash Wednesdays in three days. Um, the, the theme for our midweek Lenten services this year, this is not a great bulletin, uh, is the crucial hours, looking at crucial moments and events uh, in, in Jesus' life. Um, Ash Wednesday, we will, have, we will have communion, and the last Lenten service will have communion. The reason we do that is because our regular Wednesday nighters, if we didn't do that, they would go six weeks without receiving the Lord's Supper. Um, we will do the imposition of ashes on, on Wednesday, bringing that tradition back after the pandemic stopped it for a couple of years. And we're going to hopefully have dinners every week. We used to not do it Ash Wednesday, but we're going to do it every week. Um, we really would appreciate it if you would sign up on that sheet in the, the narthex to let us know uh, if you're going to come to at least a few of those um, so that we make sure we don't have way too much food or, or not enough. So. Wonderful to have that tradition brought back, those those Lenten dinners. March newsletter and calendar are uh, in your mailboxes. Um, Bible class, we start this new study um, on evangelism today, and we're gonna have the teens join us for this, so probably be four weeks, four week study. We're gonna do that two or three times a year, and the teens join, join the adults. I think that'll be a good thing. So teens, just uh, join us. Sunday school, of course, is meeting as well. Join us for fellowship time. I think that's all I need to announce. I hope to see you all here on Ash Wednesday. Make sure to sign the friendship registers, uh, and then please greet those sitting around you.